This is Faith Ignited, the podcast where we put God back into history. Episode 5, Dictionaries and Doctrines It was astounding just how distracted a man's mind could become. Troubled thoughts were like a festering wound, begging for attention with pangs of agony. Eventually they must be addressed, or it might prove your undoing. Noah's hands raised up to rake through his hair, frustrated by the upheaval of his own mind. His eyes glazed over yet another paragraph of the volume in front of him, not internalizing a single sentence. Whosoever shall confess me before men, him will I confess before my Father who is in heaven. Noah's eyes clamped shut as the New Testament verse rang through his mind. Again, it brought a wave of discomfort and he squirmed inwardly. Christ's admonition was a rather demanding one. It was no simple thing in Noah's mind to make a declaration of faith. His wife and two oldest daughters seemed so anxious to openly unite themselves to a Christian denomination. They all seemed to find faith so natural, easy. Noah couldn't understand it. He had too many questions, too many things that did not make sense to him. The doctrines swirled around his mind as they had so many times the past several weeks. Noah believed in God. He'd never doubted that there was a being of supreme power and perfections of character. Nature alone witnessed to him of that. And for some years he had tried to align himself with those attributes and live an upright life. But still, he couldn't manage to dismiss what he did not yet understand. Noah's fingers traced the edges of the book sitting in front of him. Education and science, those were things a man could grasp. What he wanted was a rational religion. The conferences and private religious meetings associated with the recent religious awakening taking place in New Haven had sent the town in a frenzy, including his wife Rebecca. How could she know that the preachers weren't just playing on her passions, seeking to evoke some emotion that might pass as a communication from God? He had sought to discourage Rebecca and their daughters from attending, but he hadn't forbidden them. Noah felt a wave of remorse, wondering if he'd been wrong to try and influence them thus. This thought led his mind to dwell on his own conduct. As the guilt came, he was seized by an urge to pray. After some moments of resistance, he finally submitted to the impulse, closing his book and sinking to his knees. As much as he'd been fighting this moment, as the words flowed, it felt as though the gates of his soul burst open, and he was soon pouring out his heart. A wonderful peace enveloped him, soothing and calming. It was a powerful feeling, and yet he noted how in control of himself he was. It was no illusion of the passions, or anything so fleeting. On the contrary, it was a heightening of his senses, paired with a sense of clarity that burned into his soul. It was the kind of feeling that the world could not give nor take away. Truly, it was a moment that would change him forever. The name Webster has, and probably ever will be, associated with the dictionary. But who was this man, known as the father of American scholarship and education, and also as the forgotten founding father? What motivated him to put together a dictionary with 70,000 different definitions, thousands of which would be uniquely American words not found in any other dictionary at that time? Why did he travel to England and France, learn 26 different languages, and ultimately spend 26 years putting it together? Let me present to you this educator, patriot, and man of faith and see if you ever look at the Merriam-Webster Dictionary the same way again. Noah was born in the British American colonies in the year 1758. His family was arguably a very average one. His father was a farmer and weaver in Hartford, Connecticut, while his mother worked in the home. But as Noah grew, it became apparent that he was not an average boy. He had a gift for learning. At a time when most boys were not educated past the ages of 10 or 11, Noah continued his education at the great sacrifice of his family. By 14, he'd achieved all of the education that was available to him, so he then began tutoring under Reverend Nathan Perks, who was likely the most educated man in the community. 
We can assume that the seed of faith was planted young in Noah. His parents were members of the congregational church, and his father was a deacon. His earliest recorded mentor was a reverend, and I wish we had more details about how that even came to be, but I find this religious education important in our understanding of Noah Webster, the man. The same year that Noah began college at Yale, the Boston Tea Party occurred, and it was becoming more and more apparent that America was heading into war. Noah actually had his chance to fight in the Battle of Saratoga, but by the time he arrived, the battle was already over, so Noah never actually saw combat. Though his brother did fight in the Revolutionary War and was actually taken captive for a while, but that's a story for another time. Though Noah never brandished a sword in the Patriot cause, he did use his pen to fight with ideas. To his death, he would be a very strong patriot and a defender of George Washington. As the Americans continue to fight for independence, Noah went back to school. He decided he wanted to study law, and at this point, he needed to find a way to support himself, so he began teaching. As he worked in the schools, Noah realized how dependent America still was on British texts. That was the only reference that they really had, and so all of the children were being taught from British books. And this did not bode well with Noah's patriotic spirit. He said, As an independent nation, our honor requires us to have a system of our own, in language as well as government. This marks the beginning of Noah's endeavor to make America its own entity, even in education. Noah's tired eyes gazed down at the word in front of him. As he dipped his quill one last time and finished penning the last definition, he wondered if he might at last be done. As the years had passed, more words had continued to be added, and he'd wondered if there ever was going to be an end, but he felt that his work was very near completion. His dictionary now contained 70,000 different words, 12,000 of which had never been in a dictionary before. Heaven only knew how much time he devoted to the endeavor. Even now, he was in France. He'd been studying here and at the University of Cambridge. As he stared down at his hands, Noah saw veins now prominently protruding, and the dark spots of age scattered over his skin. He'd been a much younger man when he'd begun this endeavor. Now he was 70 years old, but God had given him the strength to do it. Noah turned over the page, setting aside his quill. Even when he was dead, surely this dictionary would continue to influence the minds of future generations and shape the American future. Noah's influence on education would be immense. He traveled around America listening to the way people spoke. His dictionary would include new words such as hickory, skunk, handy, applesauce, and other words that just didn't exist in any other dictionaries. He also changed the way we spell, removing the U from words like color and honor, and the K from the words public and music. In ways we can't measure, Noah changed American education forever. But around the time Noah began working on what would be his crowning achievement and contribution to America, he had a marvelous conversion experience to Christ. In a letter to his brother-in-law, Noah related that experience, saying, I closed my books, yielded to the influence which could not be resisted or mistaken, and was led by a spontaneous impulse to repentance and prayer and entire submission and surrender of myself to my Maker and Redeemer. My submission appeared to be cheerful and was soon followed by that peace of mind which the world can neither give nor take away. He continued, Permit me to remark, in allusion to a passage in your letter, that I had for almost fifty years exercised my talents, such as they are, to obtain knowledge and to abide by its dictates, but without arriving at the truth, or what now appears to me to be the truth, of the gospel. I am taught now the utter insufficiency of our own powers to effect a change of the heart, and am persuaded that a reliance on our own talents or powers is a fatal error, springing from natural pride and opposition to God, by which multitudes of men, especially of the more intelligent and moral part of society, are deluded into ruin. I now look, my dear friend, with regret on the largest portion of the ordinary life of man, spent without hope and without God in the world. 
I am particularly affected by a sense of my ingratitude to that being who made me and without whose constant agency I cannot draw a breath, who has showered upon me a profusion of temporal blessings and provided a savior for my immortal soul. I have a hard time believing that Noah's conversion experience did not in some way affect his reduction of the dictionary. I find this especially to be the case when I consider the following evidence. In the preface of his completed 1828 dictionary, Noah wrote, To that great and benevolent being, who has borne me and my manuscripts in safety across the Atlantic, and given me strength and resolution to bring the work to a close, I would present the tribute of my most grateful acknowledgments. The 1828 Webster Dictionary contained more than 6,000 biblical references, more than any other volume at that time. Listen to some of these words and their definitions taken directly from the original Webster 1828 Dictionary. Faith. That firm belief of God's testimony and of the truth of the gospel, which influences the will and leads to an entire reliance on Christ for salvation. Religion. A belief in the being and perfections of God and the revelations of his will to man, in man's obligation to obey his commands, in a state of reward and punishment, and in man's accountableness to God. Then he adds below that, the practice of moral duties without a belief in a divine lawgiver and without reference to his will or commands is not religion. I don't think you'd find that in a dictionary today. Okay, just a couple more. It's so fascinating. Providence. The care and superintendence which God exercises over his creatures. Some persons admit a general providence but deny a particular providence, not considering that a general providence consists of particulars. A belief in divine providence is a source of great consolation to good men. By divine providence is understood God himself. And lastly, though I could go over more, inspiration. The infusion of ideas into the mind by the Holy Spirit, the conveying into the minds of men ideas, notices, or monitions, by extraordinary or supernatural influence or the communication of the divine will to the understanding by suggestions or impressions on the mind which leave no room to doubt the reality of their supernatural origin. That definition, I can't help but think, was rooted in some of Noah's personal experience. But Noah believed that education should begin with Christian principles. He said, Education is useless without the Bible. The Bible was America's basic textbook in all fields. God's word contained in the Bible has furnished all necessary rules to direct our conduct. He also said, Every civil government is based upon some religion or philosophy of life. Education in a nation will propagate the religion of that nation. In America, the foundational religion was Christianity, and it was sown in the hearts of Americans through the home and private and public schools for centuries. Our liberty, growth, and prosperity was the result of a biblical philosophy of life. Our continued freedom and success is dependent on our educating the youth of America in the principles of Christianity. Despite these amazing facts, until recently, I didn't know that the Webster Dictionary had anything to do with Christianity. But it does. Noah's motivation was both religious and patriotic. He had a vision for America. A hope that we would be able to combine faith and education. For what purpose is there to learning if you're constantly gaining knowledge but missing the most essential truths of life? Sadly, we see many highly educated people today choosing to cling to facts instead of faith, without realizing that they were meant to go hand in hand. Faith is not the effect of a trick of the senses or the illusion of the passions. It's the most valuable truth you can acquire in life, and given by the most reliable source, that of heaven itself. As Noah said, it's something that the world can neither give nor take away. When Noah died, GNC Miriam Co. purchased the rights to Noah's American Dictionary of the English Language. Thus, to later generations, it would be known as the Merriam-Webster Dictionary and other dictionaries more secular in nature would replace it as time went on. But Noah's legacy still remains today, 
and his story and his words still ignite our faith. <laughs>